group discuss, it would be good to have someone speak on the topic of mental health. And I was a board member of St. Monica's for about six years, and I have listened to Coral talk, and she's an expert on many topics, but mental health is certainly one of them. So I volunteered and said, let me reach out to Coral and see if she would put together Really, it's, she could talk about it for how many hours or days hours about days. mental health. So when we were talking about, well, we have just an hour um, to really just brush on the topic of mental health and what things we could be, should be looking for, um, and whatever else she's going to share with us. So with that, I'll turn it over to you. She does have handouts of the presentation, and I'm going to go make some additional copies. You want to just circulate mm -hmm. those, and I'm going to turn yeah. it over to Coral. Yep, I didn't know how many copies to make, so... As Jason said, my name is Coral Frizzell. I'm uh, one of the clinical directors at St. Monica's Health Service for Women. We treat women about, oh, we have about 50 at a time who have substance abuse and mental health trauma issues. Um, we have many different programs. We have about seven different, and we're going to be starting an adolescent program in the next couple months. Um, so I also teach something called Mental Health First Aid, which I'll talk about. So it's kind of hard. I'm going to be brief. I'm going to tell lots of stories, try to be entertaining. Um, but I'm also hoping if there's anything you have a chance to ask questions, any concerns you have, I can be of service to you guys, because that's what I would like to have happen. So um, we'll get started. Um, first, to talk about St. Monica's, we've been in business 50 years as of last year, and we had a big conference at that time. Um, we started out with one little house, and now we're seven different programs, <coughs> including residential six-month program, where women can have their children. Um, we also have a program without women without children. We have outpatient services, and we have a short-term residential program. So we've quite a bit expanded over the last 50 years. And we also have services for alumni. And I will also talk about um, ways you can reach our services and resources in the community to offer to you as well. So, Part of this is, hey, I don't know what to do, I have this problem, where do I go? So this is one reason to have this um, presentation. Um, this is my contact. You may call me directly, and I will hook you up with whoever. Okay. Um, that's my extension and my email. I'm more than happy to answer any questions anybody may have. Okay, our objectives today. We have an hour to talk about a whole variety. I actually teach a course in this, so I'm trying to cut it down to just bare minimum. Um, but it, you should have kind of an understanding of what kind of mental health there is. And I'd like to throw out, when you think about mental health, what do you think about? What is mental health? If anybody has any ideas, not to put anybody on the spot, but when you think about it, a very general term, when you think of somebody mentally healthy, what do you think about? That they're, they're um, you know, they have a good um, outlook on things. Positive outlook. Positive. Mm -hmm. uh, but when I first look at that, I think of uh, all the years when I was growing up, thinking somebody that was mentally ill. And I don't know why I have that connotation when I see mental health. It does. It has that connotation. Yeah. And one of the reasons we're talking is because there's a lot of stigma with mental health. And people don't think of the positive sides. To know what goes wrong, you have to know what's right. So part of it is, how do we keep ourselves mentally healthy? Um, but you do. Um, people, when they talk about mental illnesses, there's a huge push now to change how we talk about people. Because how you talk about it shapes how you think about people. Um, another, what I want to offer is 
let's say we do run into somebody who's experiencing some problems. It happens. You get customers here. Somebody gets agitated. Um, you don't know what to do. Um, kind of a, a plan of what to do. And then resources. How do we hook them up? Let's say you have a family member, let's say you have a friend, or you know, it may even be a customer and we, you know, we want to offer them some resources just to help them. Um, our goal is everybody in the United States would have some kind of training or something so we know what to do. And then suicides would drop off, we'd be able to address substance abuse problems and it would save us a whole bunch of money. It saves a lot of money. Treatment's cheaper than you know, going to jail. So that's our goal. So this is kind of a first step in giving you a taste. And so we talked about what goes wrong. We can all say, hey, what goes wrong? But how do we keep ourselves mentally healthy? It takes work. Um, I know I'm in a very high stress job and I have to work to keep myself focused and mentally healthy. So here's what some of them, you talked about being positive, being flexible, um, being able to go into situations like this and be able to cope and handle ourselves, being able to handle a different situations, being able to communicate. Um, many people who are struggling with issues have problems with communication. Um, being emotionally adjusted, being able to weather the bumps in the road. We all have bumps in the road. Can we weather and get behind it? And self-growth. Um, one of the things we talk about is how do we grow and become all we can be, right? And striving. Somebody's mentally healthy, we work on ourselves all the time. I train a lot of clinicians, I'm a clinician myself, and one thing I talk about is how do we work on ourselves, because how can we help somebody else if we're not healthy? So um, we adjust ourselves. Any other thoughts when you think about health? Like for yourselves, or for your company, or? How does the physical health relate to the mental health piece? Is there a correlation? Strong correlation. When you are not mentally healthy, let's say you're highly anxious or depressed, you become sick a lot easier. Um, you get aches and pains. You don't exercise. You don't take care of yourself. It all correlates. In fact, a lot of mental health issues have significant physical problems. Um, so that's why it's really good to take care of ourselves mentally and keep ourselves going mentally because it helps our physical health. It affects our immune system affects our cardiovascular system. Um, it affects even, you know, things like diabetes or anything. We've got to have it all working together. So when somebody comes in and they're really sick, I talk about how are you keeping yourself mentally healthy as well. And it goes for kids as well. So I work a lot with kids and kids, um, when they talk about they're sick all the time, I look at how are they adjusted mentally healthy as well. I was going to say, don't you think that today, in today's world, that if we sometimes just shut off the TV, because there's just so much out there and it's all sad and it's depressing. Yeah. It's, or know, the cell even, phone or the internet. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Not being communicated all the time. I know I'm in a business where I'm always communicating on my phone, but I do take an hour where I won't have it on. We've all got to have that in our high-paced, stressed world. That shutdown time is important. Um, doing our hobbies, taking walks, exercise, all those things we forget because we're, we got to get this done and I got to do it, you know. Yeah, that's important, yes. And we're in this world that's fast-paced and we always have to be connected to each other. Now, when I was younger, it wasn't so much. It's getting worse. And it's really helpful in a business, but health and mental health, you've got to shut it off once in a while. All right, so that's keeping yourself mentally healthy, is taking that time for yourself, making it part of your program. It's just as important as anything else you do. And it keeps you going and actually raises productivity if you're mentally keep yourself going. Hopefully this one. All right, so talking about mental
mental health, there are mental health disorders. And rather than talk about people who are mentally ill, which is a label and we're getting away from that, I'm going to deliberately talk about people struggling with mental health issues. In fact, there was just a recent study that I just read today, how you talk about a person affects how you think about them. When we say mentally ill or they're mentally ill, we automatically go to the really negative. So we're pushing to say people with mental health issues or people with mental health disorders or struggling with mental health. So sometimes things can go wrong. For no fault of our own, it could be you know, chemicals in our brain, it could be trauma from our childhood, which um, there is evidence that that can affect our mental health today. What happened in your childhood can affect you right now. Um, it could be um, many different triggers that can lead to mental health issues. You could lose people, you can have, you know, we all struggle from day to day. So um, we have many different ones, and we're going to briefly review them. And I'm going to give you stories of what you might see. Um, I'm obviously, we have a whole book called the DSM-5 that's this, this thick about all the disorders. I'm not sharing all that. <laughs> it would take, you know, I, I said I teach that course that takes nine weeks and that's still cramming. So I'm just going to give you a taste of some things you might experience or you might see other people experience so you kind of notice. Because the first step is we've got to notice. And then what happens if they're experiencing a crisis because people do and then what do we do about it? Here's this comes from Mental Health First Aid. It's a national program for teaching first aid for mental health. And this is a chart they use. 41% um, of people with a mental health use mental services. Not everybody gets treatment. There's so much stigma. They don't, first thing they don't think of to go to a counselor or, you know, they usually show up at their doctor or they just kind of hang on. But you notice that 19% of our population has an anxiety disorder of some sort. And I'm not talking like anxiety like uh, I have to get this report done tomorrow and so I'm anxious about it because that can actually help you focus if it's a little bit. But I'm talking that it affects our whole life. Like we can't function, we're so anxious. So about 20, 19, 20% of adults Major depression I'm going to talk about, I'm going to touch on substance use. Bipolar is a type of depression where you go kind of up and down significantly. Eating disorders, we run into that, and then schizophrenia. Schizophrenia is actually only about 4% or less of the population, but many times when people think of mental health disorders, what do they think of? Hallucinations, delusions, lose contact with reality very small portion. Also another message I want to give is these people we also think because it's in the media, oh my god they're dangerous. They're, you know, they're the people who hurt people. No, they usually hurt themselves or family members sometimes. But it's different kind that of people who usually do those horrible things. But again, it's that stigma we automatically think about it. It's actually only this part. So what you will notice, though, is these don't add up. And the reason they don't add up is you can have more than one. We work with people who have like anxiety disorders and a substance use. Many times they go hand in hand because people are self-medicating. Right. So um, sometimes they have many more. Depression and anxiety a lot of times go hand in hand as well. All right, so we're going to cover depression, just general depression, anxiety, substance abuse, and schizophrenia, because these are the ones we generally think about. And then the reason they're disorders, the reason we struggle with them is because it affects our physical health, affects our emotional health, and affects how we function. Um, many people who struggle with these can't keep jobs, can't come to work physically cannot get out of bed, um, physically cannot um, you know, do the things we do every day like travel across town or drive a car or things like that. It affects them so much. So 
I'm going to talk about those disorders, and I'm going to start with depression. Um, I work with many people, probably 80 to 90 percent of the people I work with have some sort of depression. Now, this kind of depression is not like, oh, I feel down one day, because we all get that. I'm sad. I'm feeling, you know, you feel that heavy weight, and you don't want to come to work. You just feel that something's happened. This is clinical depression, which means I'm not sleeping, or I'm sleeping all the time. I have a total lack of motivation to do anything I used to do. So let's say I used to go hunting. I won't go anymore. Just don't want to go. I may have physical aches and pains, so it affects me physically. I may be sick all the time. And I may have suicidal thoughts. Um, those generally go hand in hand with depression. And it's more than just sadness or feeling down. So, for example, I worked with somebody, um, she knew she had to get a job, she was one of my clients, but she physically could not get out of bed. And she would try to talk herself out of getting out of bed to be able to go and be able to, you know, do what we do all the time, find a job or get in the car. Um, and she would tell herself that, but she's like really slow, flat slow moving, cannot move. Now with treatment, like medication and talk, she was able to get a job. She was able to function. She was able to get her children back, which is one thing I work with, um, and able to function. Um, but that depression is always there. Like it just doesn't go away. Like medication just doesn't totally drive it away. You have to also work with somebody to do exercise, to have a schedule, and they, they have to physically work on these things because all that gets turned off when you're depressed. And what you will notice with somebody is they just look flat, down, and they'll stop coming to work. And just know it's not on purpose. It's because they are so down and they have so many aches and pains, they physically cannot move. That's how bad compression. And it lasts about two weeks, of, you know, minimum, and then they may come out of it for a while, and then they may go back down. And what we do is we have, you know, refer them for medication, but we also, you know, offer counseling services. Um, along with that, not only can people be depressed, they can also be highly anxious. Got them both going on. Can you imagine that? Not only can you get out of bed, but you're panicking and you're worrying and your thoughts don't stop. Like, you're racing. So a lot of people I have who have panic attacks, I had one woman, she um, it was, a, it was the same woman actually, she could not get on a bus, she could not go down to get a job, not only because she was depressed and we had to get her moving, but she'd have panic attacks. And what happens is, you get so worried, you're going to have that panic attack, and you cannot escape, and you can't get out, you stop going anywhere. So she would call me, and she'd be like, deep, can't breathe, I'm having racing thoughts, I'm afraid I'm going to die. Um, and she knew it was a panic attack, and I was able to talk her through it. But the symptoms, <clears throat> can be very similar to a heart attack. So I'm going to talk about that, how you tell the difference and what you do in that. But with anxiety, you can get those attacks where you just can't function and you feel you're going to die, so you end up in emergency rooms, etc. You also can be highly irritable, like I'll snap on a dime. Um, many people I work with who have anxiety, they might come off very angry. And it's not that they're angry, they're just like hyper in this mode where they're just reactive. So you say one thing and they'll snap at you. They may not even realize they're doing it, but they've talked about, I'm just having all these thoughts and I'm worried about what if this happens or this happens, and it freezes them. I've had clients who cannot move, cannot get a job because 
what if, what if my interview doesn't go down? What if I don't get down there? What if, you know, the car has a flat tire? What if they don't like me? What if they don't, you know, and I don't come and then I, I don't go? The worry is so consuming. And so I feel jittery and it's crippling. Um, and it's more than just that anxiety we felt. It's so much that I sit at home or I take a substance. I drink. Um, I take meth, whatever it is, to help get it down. And a lot of times I'm depressed and anxious. Any questions so far, by the way? I feel like I'm kind of... All right. On the, uh, the, per the percentages, is that changed much over the last 10 years or they just came out with some recent statistics but they're pretty similar and it's about 20 percent of the population suffers from something and why it's so high i don't know but some people say it's gone up and down we just have better ways of recording it i don't know but it hasn't changed much um all right, so we have anxiety, and it keeps us from functioning. And we're shaky and we're jittery, so this is one thing. So if you see somebody who seems highly anxious, this may be what they're going through. Okay, then we have schizophrenia. As I said, very small portion of schizophrenia, but when we think of somebody, um, this is usually what we think of. This, very recently, in fact, they found the gene that may be responsible. This is huge. We didn't know what caused it, but there is a gene, and what happens is your synapses, they prune with your connections. They actually go down as you get older. That goes haywire, and they've actually found where it comes. So this is exciting, because then maybe we can do something about this. Um, they call it a neuro disorder. There is medication, but again, it doesn't take everything away and it has side effects. So we have better medication than we used to, um, but still there's some side effects, but they have to have some kind of medication to be able to function. If you're severely schizophrenic, especially if you started at a young age, like before, usually it's 18 or before, much less likely you're going to be able to function. If it starts older, sometimes it actually gets better by itself. So what they suffer from is hallucinations, um, delusions, very flat, and they don't always make a lot of sense. So some things you might hear, like um, when you're talking to them, they use a lot of big words. And they might, and sometimes it has to do with uh, religious affiliations. Um, I don't know the re but many times they talk about angels and, and then it goes into something else and the devil is affecting me and the clock over there is ticking and, and it'll just go on and they say a lot of words but it doesn't make sense. The brain is not firing correctly. Um, I've had... People with this, I've worked with them a few times. We don't see this quite as much, but um, you could try an experiment if you'd like. If you've ever tried to talk to somebody and somebody's whispering at you and saying, don't trust them. They're evil. Uh, they're the devil. And try having a conversation. Think about that. They have that in their ear all the time. So they may not even hear what you're saying and they seem like they're not here, and they don't, they stop speaking. Um, medication is necessary, and most of them that I've worked with, if they have medication, they're able to function quite well, and we just help with case management, getting them a job, getting them a place to live. Many times they end up homeless, they're on the streets, they're the ones you might see talking to themselves. Um, because they have these voices and they're always going off and they may see things. Now, 
Hallucinations are mostly hearing things rather than seeing things. Once in a while it's something they see, but a lot of times it's something they hear. It may be a chorus of voices, it may be one person, it may be their mom or their dad or somebody, but they are outside their head, so it's not like thoughts. Delusions, we don't argue with their delusions. They may say, oh, the FBI is watching me, that kind of thing. They're here. I know it. I'm not going to tell you one thing because they'll find out. They don't trust. Um, we don't tell them, hey, they're not here because that will just, it, it doesn't do any good. They fully believe it. Um, we help them and be as warm and nurturing and understanding as we can and just help them get help. Flat affect, just like with depression, I'm talking somebody who totally flat. I don't know if I can make my face totally flat. Um, but you can tell because they talk like this and they're very flat and they may stop once in a while as they're not talking. Um, they may laugh at something that's not funny. Um, they may cry at something that is funny because they have inappropriate. And just to remember, this isn't like they, they usually know something's wrong. And they're usually like, it's just not working for me. I don't know how, what's going on with me. And they know how people feel about them. You know, I come off weird. Um, and this can really affect them. So what ends up happening is they hide in their houses. Again, they isolate. They don't get help. They don't reach out because all the stigma and the way people look at them. If you can imagine going down the street and you're talking to yourself and you have these voices and you know people are staring at you, why would you go out? So um, all these things, they lose contact with reality. We help them with medication and one thing that we try to do is give them that acceptance that they may not get anywhere else to reach them. Um, we work really hard on how we come off. We're actually, St. Monica's is what we call a trauma-informed agency, which means we recognize that people are struggling and have trauma and there's a lot that goes on with them and we watch how we approach them so everybody is welcomed, everybody's nurtured, we have, we work on our buildings on how it's presented, we work on how we dress, we work on how we respond, our tone of voice, so that when they come in our doors, they know this is one place where they're not going to get any judgment, because then we're going to lose them. Um, many times they smoke, um, and they tend to die earlier, um, because they smoke a lot and they use drugs, so um, all that affects their physical health. Carl, real quick, advice-wise, I think of maybe our tellers could run into this. If we, if someone encounters someone that is struck, what advice do you have to, from a transaction standpoint, be able to help them with whatever they may be coming to one of our facilities to do without making it uncomfortable for them, for the teller, just to carry out the transaction and be done? Any quick advice of... What I would suggest is, first of all, you never want to confront, hey, you don't make much sense. <laughs> there aren't any, you want to ask, open, oh, may I help you? Um, use a calm tone of voice. If they don't make much sense, keep to what you're talking about. Be simple. Don't go into long explanations. Um, say, okay. Um, how about, you know, we need to get your balance or we need to get your money um, and they, and just don't go there with them. Now, if they become agitated, how can I help you? Can we go to another room? I'll talk about that. Um, but always try to maintain your calmness because what happens is when somebody else is like, we tend to get agitated. So we have to take deep breaths, ask open-ended questions. I usually use open hands. Um, and I try to maintain my professional calm attitude. It usually helps them to calm themselves down. Okay. Um, I think I have something else. Yeah. All right. Substance abuse. The thing with substance.
substance abuse, there's also a lot of stigma with that. All of our women have substance abuse. In fact, to get in St. Monica's, you have to have substance abuse history. It's a disease that changes the brain. So when you start drinking a lot or you start using any of these substances, it actually physically changes how your brain reacts. So it's very hard once that process has started to stop. You can get withdrawals, it can be very scary, and the thing about substance abuse is um, your brain's programmed for it. So you're not thinking about, I need to come to work. You're not thinking about, I need to, you know, let's say make a withdrawal. You're thinking, I've got to get that drug right now. So they do a lot, you know, they may steal, and they may lie. They may because their brain is calling for it. So what I've done here are some things that you may notice not only from customers but from coworkers. Okay, because then you can, um, you know, in a calm manner, possibly talk to people. Here's some things you might notice. They come in late for work. Um, they may be, you know, not quite tracking. Um, if they're drinking, you may smell it. Um, they may not function as well at work. They may talk about it all the time. Oh, that party I had last night. Um, and you just notice something's off. Now, the best way to address something like this is not to argue with them. It doesn't any good to say to somebody, you got a problem, you need to go get help. Guess what the reaction's gonna be? No, I don't. I drink once in a while, no big deal, because their brain is, it's changed. They don't see things, they honestly don't. It's all about what's going on with them, and they may be having some struggles. Um, I've worked a lot with clients who you know, you say, yes, you have this problem. No, I didn't use, I didn't take that. Um, in fact, I expect it because it's part of the disease. So what you can do if you're worried about somebody is just point out what you notice. So I just noticed you're coming in late to work. Um, you seem to be off. I, I've noticed I've smelled some alcohol on your breath. You talk about, I'm just concerned. I'm worried about you. Um, and so if you want to talk about it, I know of some places or some ways to help, I'm here. Okay. If you, a lot of times I work with family members and family members get very upset about this and like, why can't you quit? Why can't you stop? They physically can't. And when somebody's yelling at them, they tend to use more. So what we talk about is we just need to be calm, ask if we can help, and if you're a family member, set those boundaries to protect yourself. So there, you're not running you ragged, because there's nothing you can do except to be yourself and be an ear and say, hey, I've got these services, and then do what you need to do to protect yourself. That's what we talk about. Um, it's a very emotional issue. You know, there are people who say, oh, I quit, why can't you? Everybody's different. So I've had moms who've lost their children. I've had people, women who've been nurses, professionals, lost everything. Lost their kids, lost their homes, ended up on the street. They don't want to be there. And they're like, how did this happen? Now maybe I can get some help. And they're very ashamed of themselves. So they need to work and get back on track and they're really trying but it's hard because sometimes they face that stigma and people don't give them a chance. Um, but it can happen. I've had women who have hit rock bottom, who've been nurses, been professionals, who years later, I know one I work with right now, she's our psych consulting psychologist. She's with me. She was part of our program. She was using and she got herself back on and now she tells us what to do. Um, she's very regarded in the trauma field. So 
it happens, they can recover. We both strongly believe in recovery and we all need to have hope. Any questions about any of those? Crises. Here's some of the typical crises you might follow. I tried to think of things that you might run into here. Okay, I'm trying to shape this. You're obviously not St. Monica's and have people coming in, and, you know, there are already crises. So I try to think of things you might run into, and then I have a scenario and a plan, just a general plan to help. And you can always call me as well. If you're really struggling with something, please call me. So we have the suicidal thoughts and actions. Um, we always take them seriously. Um, even if they've made the statements many times, each one is taken seriously. Nobody actually wants to really commit suicide. And we actually don't even call it commit, um, attempt suicide, or we say suicide completion. There's different ways of talking about that as well. They're ambivalent. Um, I just heard, well, the Golden Gate Bridge. There was a documentary. And there was a gentleman who came to Lincoln, and he, before he jumped off the Golden Gate Bridge, he actually survived. He said, if one person had asked me, hey, what's going on, how can I help, he wouldn't have gone through with it. Just one person. But nobody noticed. And there are signs, which I'll talk about. Sometimes it comes, you don't know, but maybe one of my goals here is if, I can help you to notice somebody and that stops somebody, I've done my job. So um, we also have panic attacks, which I kind of talked about, and some of the things you'll see and what to do. Um, that might happen. People can become agitated. I'm sure it happens here. I know it happens in St. Monica's. A customer becomes very angry. So these tools can not only be used with somebody with a mental health, but somebody who's just angry, um, how to approach people so we don't make it worse. Um, so I'm going to give you some cues on how to help that. All right. And these are best practices. So I don't know what your procedures are here. Please follow them. Um, follow the protocols, we all have them. But these are best practices that I find personally work for me and work for us and how we approach people. Um, for example, let's say somebody makes suicidal statements. I want to end it. It's too tough. Um, I want to kill myself. What do we do? How do we even, you know, that's scary. I've even had kids say that. What do we do? Um, we always take it seriously. And then here's some things that you can do, whether it happens in your family or here or whatever, some of the best ways to handle it. Stay calm yourself and ask blunt questions. It's the hardest thing you're ever going to do, but it does not make it more likely that they're going to commit suicide or they're going to go out. In fact, it's a relief. Wow, somebody noticed. So let's say what we look for is somebody who suddenly makes a change in their life. They may suddenly become depressed or maybe they're getting, getting better. They've been in that deep depression I talked about and then all of a sudden, oh, they seem fine. But maybe I'm giving away a few things, or I'm, I make statements like, well, don't worry about it, I won't be around, or something like that. But look for those changes, especially those positive changes, um, and follow your gut, how you're feeling, and if you're worried, ask the question. Because if we don't ask the question, they can slip through. So what I do is I just say, do you want to kill yourself? Do you have suicidal thoughts? Do you have a plan? Because if they have a plan and they know how they're going to do it, that raises the risk factors. I had a client just recently I had to sit down with, and her plan was to leave St. Monica's and walk out in the street in front of traffic. She had the means, she had the opportunity, it's right there. That automatically raised my red flags. 
okay, I may need to get this person some help because she could do that. So we didn't leave, don't leave them alone. Um, we also asked, do they have the means? Um, do they have a gun in the house? Do they have pills? Do they have a knife? And if they can describe this, because many times what happens is they practice it, they may even talk about it. And they may, you know, with uh, men, it's more likely to be guns, et cetera. Women, it's more likely to be like medication. Um, just ask the question, and then have you tried it before? Because if you've tried it before, more likely you're going to try it again. So those three things, if you get yeses on those, I would call 911. I would get them help. Only thing that's going to happen if you're wrong is they'll say, no, they're fine. You know, I've helped somebody. So if I get yeses to those, we actually take them to the hospital, but I don't recommend people doing that because they can just jump out of the car or do something like that. I, there are specially um, trained police officers that will EPC them and get them the help they need. And you may not agree. They may say, oh, well, no, they're fine. Or they go and they change their mind and say, oh, I'm fine, I lied. But at least we did our part. At least we did everything we could, and then we just tell them, well, I'm still here, okay? I will still reach out, I'm still here, I will listen to you, whatever's going on, and I will still do my part. If someone gets angry with us for doing that, I'm being a really good friend or a good citizen and doing everything I can. So I advocate, I'm, my threshold is pretty short whether I call, because I'd rather be safe than sorry. Um, all right. If in doubt that the person be always call 911. There's also a mental health crisis line, which I will give you. It's part of your packet. Um, Centerpoint has a crisis line that people can call if they have any mental health issues whatsoever. So you can give that out, um, and they will help. Can you call on someone's behalf? To yes, remember? and they will help you. Um, they'll give you direction on what to do, what to look for, and resources. They've got it set up. It's free service. Anybody can call them. Um, if they aren't making suicidal statements, but seem very depressed, um, then listen and offer resources. Again, if in doubt, call 911. I always go safe and sorry. Obviously, if somebody comes into your bank and they're waving a gun around or have something you call, I wouldn't even question it. All right, panic attacks. This may happen. Somebody starts breathing and they're shaking and they're sweating and they feel like they're going to die. One of the things is you can practice deep breathing yourself because it helps them. So we always breathe from here. And, and I relax myself. Let's practice some deep breaths. One of the things I suggest you do is, you know, can we sit over here? Can I get you a glass of water? Um, we'll deep breath. We'll, we'll ask this question. And we never sit facing somebody. It's a lot less anxiety producing if you sit beside them and you just practice calm breathing yourself. And then if, because they'll have chest pains, they'll have everything a heart attack would have. If they've never had these symptoms before, they don't know what it is, call 911. Again, I'd rather have them say it's just a panic attack and help them than they had a heart attack. Very similar what happens. If they've had them before and say, oh, I've had this before, I just need a moment, we just sit. And we just calmly and we listen to them. And usually within a few minutes, they can come back out of it. Okay. Um, I would take them out of where everybody is, though. If you have a quiet place to go, that really helps. You can also ask, is there anybody you can call? Do you have a family member, a friend who can help? Um, you know, can I make the call for you? I, you know, I don't know how much time you have, but 
you can at least say, is there anybody, can, do you want to use the phone? Something like that can help. Agitation. So I have a plan. I actually have a handout. Hopefully I have enough. Just general ideas, and there's a scenario on here to kind of keep with you, to remind yourself, because when you're in these situations, you can get upset and your brain is not working either. So this might help. So you can take one of those. Um, offer assistance. Best thing you can do is calm yourself. So what happens is, if somebody is agitated, because I've had clients who slam their doors, say, I hate you, cram, uh, you don't know what you're doing, this place is the worst place I've ever been at, and they're, they're just off and running, they slam. Best thing I do is I lower my voice. I'm sitting down, I'm calm. In fact, my voice goes lower and calmer. And I stick to simple statements. You know, you look agitated, you look upset. I get that you're upset, but this is our policy. Keep being a broken record if you need to. Eventually, they're going to leave. One of the things you don't want to do, though, is block the exit. So we tend to sit away from the exit. If you need to get somebody to help you, you know, can I make a quick call? Maybe I'm going to bring somebody in who may be able to help. So call your manager, call coworker, whoever it is, and get some help. Um, that helps calm the situation. If they want to drink water, offer them that. Um, if they're pacing, let them pace. Don't try to you know, make them sit down. You can say, oh, you know, you can have a seat if you wish. Um, and don't argue with them. I talk about the three-point stance. Um, hopefully you'll never have to use this, but it may be helpful. I don't know what you run into, but I know what I've run into. So one thing you can do is if you don't feel safe sitting down, let's say they're like over you, and they're in their face raising their voices at you, and they're like, oh my god, this long, what do you mean you won't give me that long, what, whatever it is, okay. You can stand here like this, and you have your feet apart, um, and have your hands ready, because if they do come at you, you're a lot more stable, okay? So you put it one foot behind, one here. Um, if they do get in your face and they won't leave, we call police. We don't mess around. You know, we say, okay, um, I'm going to have to get some help here. And then we just quickly call, or we, whoever comes and helps us can go call. Okay. We don't stand and argue with them. We don't, and we repeat ourselves, and we just keep ourselves calm. Usually they'll end up leaving. Usually they'll end up slamming the door or leaving the building, and they're gone. But once in a while, and but our safety comes first. All of your safety comes first. If somebody is really, you feel threatened, call help. You know, none of us have big muscles and can wrestle. So I don't. We don't even try. Um, don't argue. I've had clinicians, I've had people, you want to be right, right? <laughs> I know, you know, this is how it is, and I'm going to argue with you point by point. Waste of time. They're in that hyper state, they're not even hearing you. So, I just kind of say, wow, you look really agitated. I can get that this is upsetting, this is our policy, or I might just sit there silently while they're going off. I don't, it's a waste of time to get into arguments. It, you're not going to win. It's, you know, we're not going to get brownie points for that. But they think they're right and let it go. I was just going to mention that um, out here we don't always think we're going to see anything. And not too long ago we had someone in our department that I happened to look up and noticed that she was walking across the hall in our area. And I knew it wasn't an employee. Mm -hmm. And so I went and got out, went to the lady. She was an older woman and she had a Kleenex box with her. And she didn't remember how she got here. Mm -hmm. And so what a coworker, we, she said, you know, my daughter's phone number is here.
here somewhere. And so I found it on the Kleenex box. But she was like, I'm going to leave. And we, we got the keys somehow. And then we just sat, I sat with her. And then she went to walk. And so I got a coworker. So we walked around the building. Yeah. And then I called the daughter. And the daughter cried. And she just said, oh, she, I think she's got Alzheimer's. Because she didn't know how she got here. Yeah, that can happen. But we stayed and kept. And then we walked and walked because she would sit down. In that situation, no, you don't want to leave them alone no, because they yeah. can. But I was surprised that, you know, you, know, you kind of think you're protected out of here, and right. I was really surprised. Um, yeah, it happens everywhere. Yeah. Um, I've run into them in hotels, on the street, mm -hmm. bus stops, uh, stores. Um, I don't think I've run into them in a bank yet, but it's always a first time. But it sounds like you did a great job, so. Um, well, I, I think she was thankful to God. Well, I know she was, but, you know, she kept oh, saying, I think I'm okay, I'm okay. And kind of, we just talked about the weather. And yep, everything yep, else. and just have a chat. I'm a person, I'm here. Yep. And you kept her safe, so. All right, any questions about this? Is this helpful? I'm hoping it's helpful. Okay. Here's some resources. This is the crisis line. It's on your slides. You can call, anybody can call, 24 hours a day. There's a licensed condition available. Okay. There's also, I have the National Suicide Hotline. You can offer that, you know. Um, this is a Kia house. Now let's say this is more, you know, if you're struggling with somebody in your family and you don't know how to help them or they're on the street, there is something called the Kia house that they can stay for a little while and be off the street. It's for people with mental health disorders and emergency situations. So if you don't know what else to do and how to help this person, that's a number you can call and they'll get them in for a few days until we can find something else for them. Um, the Orchard is um, it's a coffee house for people with substance abuse problems or mental health where they can sit down and have coffee and they have people there to talk to them. So a lot of times people are very lonely. They don't have anybody to connect to. Um, you know, like that lady who came in off the street, and so they may just want somebody to talk to and connect to. So this is a place that they can go and sit down, and there's licensed people and people that have lived through it who can help them. Okay. We also offer a service called...